Well, good evening and welcome back to the Journey Home program. I'm your host, John Mark Grodi here on EWTN. And once again, we have this great opportunity to come together to think on the good things the Lord has done in our lives. And tonight in particular, we're uh, joined by Courtney Comstock. She's a former Pentecostal, uh, sharing her story of how she discovered the Catholic Church. Courtney, thanks for being with us tonight. Thank you for having me. I appreciate you coming to share your story. Uh, from Pente Pentecostal background, you know, that's a, that, there's some uniqueness there. Right. So, we'll hear about tonight. <laughs> so I'll invite you to go way back to the beginning. Tell us uh, how your story begins. Well, I, um, my father was yeah. raised Mormon and okay. his whole side of the family, they actually came over the U.S. with mm -hmm. Brigham Young and okay. it was, um, you know, their entire life. Uh, he left the church when he was a teenager okay. and um, my mom was raised Pentecostal and when I was little, I remember my earliest memory was my dad didn't go to church with us and my mom uh, took me to a First Southern Baptist. So I remember going to Sunday school at mm -hmm. First Southern Baptist, a really small one in my hometown. And then uh, we kind of started church shopping almost. I remember she would take me to this church and if she wasn't fully comfortable there, didn't like it, we would try another one. But mm -hmm. they were all basically uh, different types of Pentecostal churches. Gotcha. Right. And then I just remember as a teenager, I did my rebellious thing and I didn't want to go to church and I would put up sure. a stink every Sunday morning. And so eventually she yeah. just stopped asking me to come and she would go herself. What did so. that Pentecostalism look like, sound like, you know, in your experience? It, uh, I have always thought it was really strange. As okay. a little girl, you see these adults who get very animated mm -hmm. and speaking different languages. Mm -hmm and this would sing for what felt like five hours at a time. And I never understood what was happening. It was never explained to me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't understand why I wasn't feeling what these other people seemed to be feeling. Right. And it kind of scared me. People were acting strange, these grown adults who on any other day of the week are perfectly normal. But then on Sundays, things just got weird, what I thought was weird. Mm -hmm as a child and it wasn't explained to me. There was no foundation for it and I didn't understand it and didn't care for it. Gotcha. So the, the, the externals of, of the religion didn't connect with you. Did you have a sense of God, a relationship with God, prayer? I felt like I did okay. sometimes, but it wasn't anything that I uh, felt every day of the week. Yeah. It was here or there. And I was always, I always believed in God. Mm -hmm. I never stopped believing in God, mm -hmm. but I didn't understand how, are, how come these people are claiming that they have this personal relationship with God mm -hmm. that is so strong and overwhelming, and I'm not feeling that. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So you get to your teen years, and you're starting to become disenfranchised with this stuff. Right. I, yeah. I, I was one of those, I believe in God, but I don't believe in organized religion. Mm -hmm. Where did that come from? That, that doesn't just spring from some, a teenager's mouth. Usually that, that was that uh, the friends or the school? or I'm, I think it was a little bit of everything. Culture. You know, everything yeah. influences you yeah. during those years. And first, you know, like I said, I didn't understand where I came from. Mm -hmm. I didn't like it. Mm -hmm. And I figured, you know, I'll just believe in God because I was raised that that was enough. If you believe in God and you have a personal relationship with him in your heart, mm -hmm. you're good. Gotcha. So I'm like, why do I need to go to church? Right, right. Okay. Well, what happened next? I remember, uh, you know, I hadn't gone to church for many years, and which I know disappointed my mother. Mm -hmm. And I was dating a Catholic boy in high school. Okay. And he wasn't uh, super on fire with his faith, but mm -hmm. he did invite me to Mass. And I thought it was really interesting. Mm -hmm. That was about as far as it went. I He had me take home one of those little plastic rosaries that they have there. Right. And I was like, this is kind of neat. I don't know what you do with it. Is it a necklace? What is it? <laughs> and I, when I went home, I was excited to tell my mom I went to church because I knew she would be like, oh my gosh, you went to church? This is great because that's all she ever wanted me to do. Right. And when I told her I went to a Catholic mass, her face completely changed. Mm. She was visibly upset. And I wasn't expecting that. So I was I was just like, what did, what did I say? What did I do wrong? And 
she went off about how all these awful things the Catholics do, like they worship statues, which it says you're not supposed to do that in the Bible, and they worship Mary, and you're only supposed to worship God, and they pray to Mary, and you're only supposed to pray to God, and she went through all of that, and I was just like, okay, I am not going to bring this up again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, sorry, I went there, <laughs> yeah. and I didn't say anything more about it. Gotcha. Yeah. So do you, that uh, that was kind of new for you, but that that would been there'd been a strong into Catholicism. Was that more personal, or was that part of the communities that she'd been a part of that you guys had been a part of? Um, Catholicism was never really brought up because I don't have anyone in my family on either side, mom or dad, who yeah. are are Catholic. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really grow up hearing the anti-Catholicism, but it was always an underlying factor. Mm -hmm. And I, and it just reared its ugly head sure. when I had brought it up. Right. And that's when I realized I was just like, oh, this is, I don't understand this, what it felt like hatred, Yeah. you know, but I didn't want to go there again. I'm like, I don't want to upset gotcha. mom. Yeah. I'm just not going to bring it up. <laughs> right. All right. Well, what, what happened after that? So I, once again, wasn't really going to church. Mm -hmm. My When I was a young adult, my mom um, asked me again to start going with her, and I did. We went to a local, what's called a four-square church. Right. I didn't know what that meant, but we started going to the four-square church, and I met the pastor and his wife, who were really great people. And it was a very small congregation, mm -hmm. which I liked. It felt a little more homey than like the really large ones with the big band mm -hmm. and the concerts and all of that. And I kind of liked it. So I started going with her, not weekly, but a lot more often than I was. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then my boyfriend at the time had proposed to me. I was about 21 okay. and we decided to get married in that four square church. Okay. So I did all my marriage prep there and, um, at the time, he was living in another state, so we did long distance marriage prep. Mm -hmm. So I did that with the pastor and his wife, which was great. And um, I felt pretty at home there, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, then what happened? So fast forward um, after being, you know, being too young to get married and not understanding what I was getting into yeah. and getting divorced and mm. um, fast forward to where I meet, re-meet my current husband. We had dated several years back and then we reconnected mm. and got married and he was in the Air Force so I moved with him to where he was stationed. I got pregnant and I started shifting my mindset here where I was thinking there is a miracle happening inside of me right now. Like yeah. I am growing a human, which is, and then, you know, when you can start feeling the baby kick and stuff, it just feels miraculous. It's yeah. amazing what is going on in there. And I started thinking of a higher power again and how we all fit into this and what it means to create another human being. And I had a couple of Catholic friends back home. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to call one up. And <laughs> my friend Rachel, and I asked her, I'm just, I said, you're a good Catholic. You go to church all the time. I'm like, why does everybody hate you guys? <laughs> <laughs> I honestly want to know. And she laughed and she just said, we are so misunderstood. Mm. So misunderstood. And she goes, why don't you start doing some research and you can figure out on your own what it is that we believe. And so that kind of started this domino effect. Gotcha. I was just, I wasn't interested mm -hmm. in becoming Catholic at all. Mm -hmm. I wasn't interested in going to church again weekly. I just had questions. Right. And was your husband, what was his? My husband faith? was not raised in any religion whatsoever. Okay. Uh, I mean, he had never even heard of the most basic Bible stories that they teach you, especially in, in like the Pentecostal Sunday school right. where you learn about Moses and Jonah. And he had never heard of those Bible stories before. Mm -hmm. yeah. So he was really just not exposed to it at all. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We're joined tonight by Courtney Comstock, former Pentecostal. Uh, Courtney, so again, you're, you're exploring again. You're asking these questions about... 
uh, about Catholicism, intrigued by the, the anti-Catholicism, mm -hmm. what, again, what would you say that was going on in your heart that was sort of prompting these questions? Were you, were you searching for something in your life at this point? Were you, you know, what was the, what was sort of the motivating factor there? I think a little bit of it I was searching, but I didn't know it at the time. Mm. You know, looking back, I can see that I was searching. It was more intellectual. Sure. I'm like, okay, we have billions of Catholics here, but then over here we have people saying that everything they're doing is wrong and it's against the Bible and it's not true. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just like, all right, I got to figure this out for myself right. and see what's really going on here. Yeah. And I, that's all I wanted to know at that point. Yeah. What's the beef and yeah. why? Well, in a funny way too, uh, I think family life tends to, in a weird way, the practicalities of family life tend to, to get those theological the questions going again because you're mm -hmm. confronted with, again, the, the realities of of life and death and messiness and all that kind of stuff. And it's sort of this question of, like, what do I believe about human life? What do I believe about the world? Like, does it fit? Does my picture of the universe and of God and all this stuff does it fit what I'm experiencing? Right. Yeah. All right. So you so you begin to explore these questions again. Yeah. Yes, and I checked out or bought every book I could get my hands on mm -hmm. and inundated my Catholic friends with questions mm -hmm. that even they didn't know the answers yeah. to. Some what were of them. some of your big ones? What would you say? Some of the, the big burning ones that you had? Well, do you really worship Mary? Okay. And what's the deal with Mary? Why is she such a central figure? Mm -hmm. Because when, when I was growing up, Mary only popped up during Christmas. Right. And she had a very small part. Yeah. And then she was put away again. Right. So I didn't understand her central role in everything. And okay. I, you know, I didn't understand the tangible things mm -hmm. like rosaries yeah. and stuff like that. I didn't understand the crucifix because the cross was empty everywhere I went. Right. So to see a body on it, I was just like, well, that's kind of morbid. Mm -hmm. And why do they have that and we don't? Mm -hmm. So it was little things like that. And, um, I just needed an understanding of how, just because these people believe this, how it could generate so much animosity in other people. Mm -hmm. And I needed to know <laughs> these misconceptions, how they can be understood mm -hmm. to be like, yes, these are people and they love the same God you love, you know, yeah. and why? Yeah, it's almost like if, if um, when you encounter a group like that, you know, that is, that is really hated for their beliefs. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like there's a couple options. Either they're, they really are as bad as everyone says. Right. Or maybe there's something to this. Because if, right. if, if, it, if there was nothing threatening about their beliefs, mm -hmm. then people, the world wouldn't care. Right. right? So it's got to, there's something there sometimes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and the crucifix was another big problem mm. um, in my house. I... After my divorce, I had went to live with my best friend for a little while mm -hmm. to kind of regroup. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and her family is Lutheran. Yeah. And her uncle um, had walked in on me one day when I was a complete wreck because I was going through a divorce mm -hmm. and it was hard and ugly yeah. and all of those. And he gave me a gold necklace that was a crucifix hmm. necklace. And he told me, he was just like, you need to just lean on Jesus in times like this and he will get you through it. And I was really touched by that. And so I wore it all the time. Mm -hmm. And when I went back home to visit, because I was living out of state, um, my parents were very happy to see me. My mom goes to give me a big hug. She sees what's around my neck and just stops. Mm -hmm. And she was, and she said, what is that? And I was just like, oh, well, you know, my friend's uncle gave it to me as comfort. And she was just beside herself, almost speechless. And I, and I was like, something this, what I felt was just a little insignificant right. in the scheme of things, really affected her. Right. It was a disproportionate sort of response to what, what you understood it to be. Which, again, from your perspective, there shouldn't be anything particularly wrong with with a corpus on the cross, right? We, right. You believed in Christ's death and resurrection, mm -hmm. but it's really just because it was a, it was a Catholic thing. Yes, and, really and what I was raised as he is risen. Right. So there's no reason to have him on the cross because he is risen. Yeah. So that was 
what her thinking was. You know, it's interesting that that, that particular objection, that particular uh, uh, situation occurred because it occurred in the context of this time of great pain, mm -hmm. right? And I, we'll, we'll have to revisit it a little bit later in the story, but like that is a difference there of recognizing where does pain and suffering fit in the life of the Christian? You know, some Christians would say, oh, if you're, you're, if you're a faithful Christian, you're not going to have pain and suffering. Right. Whereas, you know, we, as Catholics, we would understand that a little differently. Right. So, oh please. man, Catholic guilt. I know what that is now. It's real and alive. <laughs> sure. So we can revisit that later. But um, so that's one of the things that you began exploring at that point, this question of these questions, you know, the, the cross, the crucifix, Mary. Uh, as you yeah. began to explore that, did you discover answers that were satisfactory to you? To an extent. Hmm. I wasn't completely satisfied because mm -hmm. I kept reading. Yeah. I had to know more. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, and who are all these saints? Mm -hmm. These people I've never heard of, didn't even know existed. And it just kept, every layer I would peel off, it would reveal something else. And I'm like, oh, well, where does that come from? How does that fit into Catholicism? Mm -hmm. And it just kept going and going and going. And anyone who's researched Catholicism, I mean, it's daunting. Yeah. It, we, we've been here a minute. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a lot. I wasn't feeling like I wanted to convert, though. Yeah. It was purely intellectual yeah, for intellectual a long time. Yeah. yeah. And what were some of the surprises, you know, that you, that you found in that? You say? Most of the surprises I found were in this book that I read called Why Do Catholics Do That? Right. And as I'm reading, this author would take all of these little tidbits about Catholicism, like the crucifix, genuflecting, the rosary, even the sign of the cross, mm -hmm. and connect it to scripture and tradition. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, wow, this does have a meaning. It does come from something. This wasn't made up by a bunch of, a bunch of guys sitting at a table. Mm -hmm. This is a thing, and it has roots. Yeah. And that was when I think the, the shift happened. Gotcha. All right. Yeah, all those roots, they, you follow those things back, they all come back to Christ. Mm -hmm. right? Even the things that don't immediately seem to be about Christ, like this focus on Mary, that, that's a big a barrier for many people. Yes. You know, like, why are we talking about other people other than Christ? Mm -hmm. But of course, as you dig into Catholic devotion about Mary, well, Mary's always pointing to Christ. You know, and any of the saints, right, the only reason that we venerate them, that we, we ask for their intercession, that we focus on them, is because they give us this example of living out, following Christ. Right. right? But it all comes back, back to him. Mm hmm Right. So this shift begins to occur. Talk about that. Yeah. I, I'm like, okay, this makes sense to me, and I feel okay about it, which I kept to myself, <laughs> except for a couple of Catholic friends. Yeah. And I don't remember, um, I wasn't really into, this, into uh, the history of the saints, per se. Mm -hmm. I was really trying to get into the stuff that most misconceptions are focused on. Mm -hmm. And my friend Rachel, once again, she gifted me a copy of Butler's Lives of the Saints. Mm -hmm. And I was going through it and reading about a saint a day because that's how it's set up. Yeah. And I came across on October 12th, there was um, a little thing about St. Cyprian of Carthage. Mm -hmm. And I was reading it and they had a couple of his quotes in there. And I don't know why, but I was just like, I like what this guy is saying. Mm -hmm. Something about it really clicked with me. So I started researching him, which, oh my goodness, yeah. he liked to write. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and I started looking up his treatises, and then I decided, you know what, I need to read everything this guy ever wrote, because mm -hmm. I can't get enough. And he's uh, an early church father, so he's writing in, within... Early church. Right. Right. Yeah. Just, you know, generations after the apostles. So we're talking about a time of church history that, again, many Protestants probably aren't super familiar with. Nope. Right, there's just kind of a gap there. Yeah. Oh yeah, I, yeah. I didn't know there was a such thing as church fathers. Mm -hmm. I have never been told, you should read the writings from the people who were taught by the apostles who were taught by the apostles, and right, so on, right, you know? Right. That wasn't a thing. You don't go back that far and read that, no. Yeah, yeah. It, and I, I'm reading these church fathers and I'm thinking, everything they're saying and talking about is the same thing Catholics are doing now. Like, that is amazing. How much closer to Jesus can you get? Mm -hmm. Because we 
are walking in the footsteps, the spiritual footsteps of what the, these people were doing two, over 2,000 years ago. We're doing so many of the same things with the same beliefs. Right. And that connected me with Jesus mm -hmm. like I have never felt before. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that the, you, encountering the early church fathers, part of what it brings, there's the specific, specifics of the writings themselves, the doctrines, what they're talking about. But it's like the, the meta question there is, you know, what, what is the shape of the Christian faith? How does it work? How, do, how does uh, what Christ taught and what he said, how does that get to me? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the Bible, of course, is, is an obvious example of this question where we have many Protestants grow up with a, a, a basic sola scriptura idea. I get it all from the Bible, but where did the Bible come from? Where does it fit in the history of the story? And once you start digging into the church fathers, you recognize, well, Christianity has this historical shape. It has this ap apostolicity. Mm -hmm. It has this uh, historical continuity. That's part of what it means to be Christians, to connect with them. And so these questions about, well, yeah, what did, what did those fathers a few generations after the apostles think? That becomes a, a really important question. Well, and just like you mentioned the Sola Scriptura, that's so mm -hmm. right. We... Are never, we don't have time to be curious about what came before the Bible because mm -hmm. it is the Bible, Bible, Bible. You you memorize your right. verses, you wear T-shirts that say John three sixteen, and you yeah. call it a day. Yeah, you know. And so I was never even curious about what came before that. As far mm -hmm. as I knew, it didn't even exist. Right, right. And you dig into those fathers, and you realize, well, they, you know, the first you have the history of the Bible itself, how it mm -hmm. came together, how it was the authority of the church you know, that canonized those particular books and right. left others out, you know, that, that they concluded weren't inspired, but also then that there's a, there's a continuity, there's a tradition, there's a history of the church interpreting and guarding and dealing when there's questions about, well, what does the scripture mean on this point? What does mm -hmm. it say? Uh, there's a history there. Uh, it, it's not up to me and my Bible alone that there, right. there's, there's, a, there's a tradition to connect with here about how I even approach some of these questions. And how can you read the church fathers and, and see how they worshiped back then yeah. and their um, writings on the Eucharist? Mm -hmm. How can you read that and be like, well, that's not right. They're wrong. Mm. This is how we worship now. This is the right way to do it. Mm -hmm. I don't, I, there's a total disconnect there for right. me. It at least begs the question. Right. right? I, I, have to, I have to have a good, re, a good question or a good answer to the question of why am I not Catholic? Mm -hmm. Why am I not doing these things? Why am I, I, we didn't ask about that earlier, why am I a Protestant? Would you have identified as a Protestant with that, that term? Would you say I'm a Protestant Christian? I identified as non-denominational. Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Because even that, even that name, you know, protesting what? It still begs yeah. the question that there's a history there that I should know and I should have an answer for. Right. Yeah. Well, let's take a little break there. Okay. You know, the shift is beginning to occur. You're asking these questions and you're encountering the early church fathers, which of course opens a whole new world. Oh, yes. We'll be back in just a couple minutes. Um, again, thank you for joining us for this episode. We'll hear the rest of Courtney's story here in just a few minutes. Uh, I want to encourage you to go to chnetwork.org slash story. There's actually a written version of Courtney's testimony. It's entitled The Courage to Convert. And there's as well as hundreds of other stories there from every background. And so you'll, you'll find someone who talks and thinks uh, and believed as, as you have or do. Uh, but you also hear their stories about how they came to believe in the Catholic Church. And so check that out at chnetwork.org slash story. In the meantime, we'll be back in just a couple minutes to hear the rest of Courtney's testimony. See you then. Welcome back to the Journey Home program. We're entering the second half of our hour tonight, speaking with Courtney Comstock. She's a former Pentecostal, and a written version of this story can be found at chnetwork.org slash story, uh, entitled The Courage to Convert. But Courtney, thanks for sharing your story tonight. Mm -hmm. Really enjoying it so far. Um, when we left off, you're encountering this, this shift in thinking as you begin to, to kind of poke and prod, pull the threads in some of these anti-Catholic uh, uh, opinions that you'd encountered. Uh, you get into Cyprian and the early church fathers, and this really is opening your mind to a, a different shape, a different image of the history of Christianity and what it right. means to be a Christian. So what happens next? Well, that shift started to happen and because for a handful of years, it was purely intellectual curiosity. Right. 
And then the shift started to happen where I was like, this might be something I could believe in. Oh mm -hmm. my gosh, I am scared to death. <laughs> right. And so my husband had gotten out of the Air Force. Mm -hmm. We moved back to our home in Arizona. So I was able to go to mass with my friends mm -hmm. who had been helping me with my questions throughout the years while we were stationed. And so I went to mass and I was completely lost. <laughs> I had no idea what was going on or why. And it looked a whole lot different from what you'd seen in your youth. Oh my gosh, you know, because it, in my youth, you, you, you go and you start singing mm -hmm. and you sing and you sing and you sing. And then you have um, someone talking to you for an hour, maybe an hour and a half. Mm. Wow. And then you have coffee. <laughs> so this, I, I had no clue what was going on. I was so lost. And my friend was just like, don't worry about it. Just... You know, you don't have to kneel or anything. Just take it all in. Yeah. So I was, I was intrigued enough to continue to go. Mm -hmm. And what I noticed when I was looking around, when people would kneel, and I saw a lot of them just like this. They weren't looking at the priest. They weren't worried about what everyone else was doing. They were all just in their own place. And it was quiet and it was peaceful. And I'm like, this is reverence. Mm. I have never seen reverence like this. Just, I was in awe. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this is what it means to have a relationship with Christ. This isn't scary or weird or loud or strange. It is just pure, uninterrupted reverence. And I said, I want that. Wow. I have to have that connection. That's the relationship that I want. Mm. And then I started to pine for that Eucharist. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I, I need to have that right yeah. there. I need that in my life. Yeah. So my friend was like, well, you better sign up for RCIA. And I'm like, well, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, and, and the Eucharist is one of those things that you encountered in your reading the early church. Right. That obviously was very different than what you brought up with. Um, and probably even, not, not just the Eucharist, but really the whole sacramental economy, the whole, the whole sacramental view would have been different. I mean, what do you recall growing up as a Pentecostal, what was the view of baptism? What did baptism do? Uh, I was not baptized. I remember I had asked my mom okay. at some point when I was younger why I wasn't baptized, and she said it wasn't necessary. Okay. You just had to ask Jesus into your heart and, you know, be a good person, and you're, you know, you don't need it. Mm -hmm. You don't need to be baptized. It's not necessary. Okay. And so I thought people that were baptized were just taking it a little too far. I'm like, all right, now you're getting fancy. Right. Calm down. And... Uh, when we had, we would have like the little tiny grape juice cups that yes. they would pass around on like a tray. So everyone had their own little shot of Welch's uh -huh. and then some little crackers and that. And I was just like, oh, a snack. Like it didn't have any mm -hmm. meaning to me. And so when I saw that people were receiving the Eucharist, and I'm like, well, I can go do that, right? You know, and it's just like, no, there's a, f a few things you need to take care of beforehand. And I'm like, okay, I can do that. So right. I go and sign up for RCIA right. and I explain my story to the RCIA director. And, right. and it had come up. He had asked, okay, well, have you been married before? And I said, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. But, you know, I'm my husband now. We're good. We've got a family, you know, and he said, you might have to get an annulment. I'll have to get you in contact with one of our deacons who does that. And I'm like, what is that? I'm divorced. It says so in court. Mm -hmm. I can give you the paper. Mm -hmm. And he's like, no, 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 no. This is something else entirely. And I was so confused. I'm like, what does yeah. this mean? I don't get it. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's interesting. It's funny because you're running up against, uh, in all three sacraments, really, right. baptism, marriage and the Eucharist, you're, you're running up into a very different view of what the sacraments are. Because mm -hmm. if they're merely symbols, well then what, you know, if, if it's just something I'm doing, right. maybe as a, an act of piety, then then what's the big deal? 
you know, if I go receive Eucharist at the Catholic Church, even though I'm not Catholic, what's the big deal if I've been yeah. married and divorced? What's the big deal about baptism? Because mm -hmm. I'm sure that you're going to have to be baptism as part of this right. process. We're going to hear it in a bit. But what, what's the big deal if it's merely a symbol, if it's merely mm -hmm. a, an act of piety? It's very different because we would see as Catholics that, no, these really do something. Something real happens that's beyond my consent, beyond my belief, beyond my will. Something really happens in the sacraments. And so they, they're a bigger deal than, than yeah. Right. And, and, you know, growing up uh, Protestant, if people get married and divorced and, right. and it doesn't put a hiccup in their church life. Yeah. You know, you just keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. So I had no, in all the years of research that I had done, for some reason, I had just never come across this topic. Yeah. But I mean, this was probably a pretty big bomb to drop on you as you're Right. So I had Approaches called the deacon and I met with him and I'm like, all right, what does this mean? What is it you need me to do? Just tell me what to do. I will do the things, whatever. Let's do it. Get it over with because yeah. I'm just a very like, let's get it done type yeah. of person. Yeah. And he, he told me, he said, okay, well, technically you are not married to your current husband. Mm -hmm. and I'm like, yes, I am. It says so on the paper. <laughs> And, and then he proceeded to tell me about how marriage is for life and it cannot be dissolved by, mm -hmm. you know, the city government mm -hmm. that stamps your paper. Mm -hmm. And it, when he told me about this process I would have to go through, he's like, there's this questionnaire that you're going to have to answer because we're going to have to figure out where your relationship fell apart before you even got married, where mm -hmm. there wasn't um, a bond there in the first place. Mm -hmm. And um, we, you're going to have to get witnesses. And basically, what I was sitting there and I just kept shrinking and shrinking and shrinking and thinking, I am never going to make it. Mm -hmm. This, I, I can't see the finish line anymore. Mm -hmm. And I was really upset. I had a really hard time coming to terms with that because I didn't understand. And uh, I remember talking to my friends about it and they were just like, why are you doing this? Mm. Why even, I mean, the Catholic Church has so many rules. It's so ritualistic. You know, why put yourself through this? Mm -hmm. You don't have to do this. Just let it go. Mm. But I couldn't. Yeah. Yeah, and you didn't. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> apparently. The, so, <laughs> in my diocese, yeah. uh, they're you know, understaffed yeah. and very far behind. So mm -hmm. the deacon had told me, you know, you cannot be received into the church until your annulment has been decided. Okay. And it could be decided either way. Mm -hmm. And it could take two years. Okay. So you started the process? I did. I started the process right when I started RCIA in the fall of 2017. Okay. And then I found out mm -hmm. after that, my husband was going to have to get an annulment as well. Mm because he had been previously married. <clears throat> and he's not religious, like I said. Right. He's not looking to become religious. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to enter the Catholic Church. So I was like, why does he have to do it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like, I don't understand. <laughs> yeah. And so I had, my husband was aware of what I was doing with my annulment. Mm -hmm. So I had gone to him and I'm like, how much do you love me? <laughs> <laughs> because I'm going to have to ask a really big favor. Mm -hmm. And I explained to him what he was going to have to do the process as well. And I'm like, <clears throat> are you willing to do this for me? And he said, well, I love you. I know that this is very important to you. But please don't ask me to join the church, to become Catholic, or to do anything that I don't want to do. But yes, I'll do this for you. And I said, that is a deal. I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> So then he started working on his annulment process as well. And of course, he had to get witnesses. So his family members that he had asked to help him corroborate his relationship mm. were just like, what is this? Right. What does this mean? What are you doing? I don't get it. Right. So it, I mean, thank God that they participated. Yeah. But yeah, people didn't understand it just as much as I didn't understand it. Right. Yeah. Okay. But it kept going, right? You didn't give up. You persevered. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. After our CIA was done, um, the Easter of 2018, yes. I watched my classmates get received into the church, and mm -hmm. my 
and my husband's annulments were not complete. Mm -hmm. So I remember on Easter vigil, I was sitting in the front pew watching them get baptized and confirmed, and I was just sobbing mm -hmm. because I had spent eight, nine months with these people, mm -hmm. learning and growing and going to retreats mm -hmm. and coming to this point that I could not participate in. Yeah. And I was just like, God, when is it going to be my turn? I felt, I, I questioned it a lot. I'm like, yeah. why am I doing this? Mm -hmm. Why am I putting myself through this? I'm going through this annulment where I'm digging up these skeletons from my past that I had tucked away a long mm -hmm. time ago, all this hurt and all this pain, and I'm reliving it out on paper and it, it was, it was hard. Mm -hmm. It was very upsetting. Yeah. <clears throat> At the same time, through that RCA process, had you, had you come to understand the faith more? Had the, it, that obviously had cemented more your desire to become Catholic, which is what led to that, that pain. Right. Pain. Yeah. Uh, I remember we went on some retreats, mm -hmm. and um, I, I remember um, one of the mentors in the RCIA program. She loved the rosary. And she really wanted us to just try it and get a feel for it. And I could not connect with the rosary. Mm -hmm. I was just, this is repetitive prayer. Mm -hmm. It's strange to me. I couldn't do it. I also still had trouble with the crucifix. Mm -hmm. And I remember my RCIA director, he said, here's what I want you to do. He said, I want you to buy a crucifix for your house, put it somewhere where you see it every day, and I want you to kiss it. And I'm like, really? And he goes, trust me, kiss the crucifix. Mm -hmm. So I did it. I bought one. I put it on my mantle. And I felt strange, but I kissed it, making sure nobody was watching. <laughs> <laughs> and it really did change me. Hmm. Now I have one in every single room. Hmm. What do you think that is? What, what was the change there? Someone had explained it to me that the crucifix, looking at a crucifix, that is what should remind you of what sin looks like. Mm -hmm. And the pain that he went through, that's the pain of sin. Mm -hmm. And it's a reminder to be, you know, to be not, don't let sin dominate your life. Mm -hmm. Because look what he had to go through. Right. And I was just like, I never thought about it that way. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the gospel all put together in one there. There's our sin. Mm -hmm. There are the effects of our sin, but yep. also there's the depth of God's love. Right. For us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So you get to our, you get to the end there, you get the Easter, Easter vigil, and you're even more, in some sense, in, in conflict and pain because you're not able to enter the church and you've been learning more about it and you've been growing in it, but it's not, uh, it's not there, not there yet. And, okay. and I'm waiting on my annulment decision. And, um, then it finally came through Okay. and they had accepted it and it was annulled. And I felt this weight come off of me that mm -hmm. I didn't realize I was carrying around since my divorce. Mm -hmm. It's like all of it was gone. Mm -hmm. It was very cathartic. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I get it now. Mm -hmm. Through that whole process of digging up the past and reliving all of that and the pain and the hurt. And then I didn't realize it was weighing me down. Yeah. And it was gone. Yeah. You understand annulments a whole lot more now. And we'll talk about that later. I mean, mm -hmm. that you're actually involved in, in some of that ministry. But looking back now, interpret that weight a little bit, if you would. Because what what... I mean, especially for those who aren't familiar with it, like what is the difference between an annulment and a divorce? Why was it necessary to go through that? How would you explain that to somebody who's maybe encountering that bomb being dropped on them when they want to become Catholic? Right. Well, when you read in Scripture, it does say that marriage is indissoluble by man. And so mm -hmm. you have your secular government that mm -hmm. says, you know, here, yes, you're divorced. Yes, you're married. And here's a piece of paper that proves it. That doesn't mean anything mm -hmm. in canon law, mm -hmm. you know, they don't care because mm -hmm. this is a scriptural thing. It's not a, a legal thing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the thing with annulments that I learned is I thought, okay, I'm just going to have to write about all the nasty things that happened during the marriage and why mm -hmm. we got divorced. Mm -hmm. And that's not it. Right. They 
want you to look at the beginning, like the courtship. Mm-hmm. Because if there was not a a bond and an, and also both parties going into it with a complete understanding of what it means to be married under God, yeah. you know, where was that disconnect in the beginning? Mm-hmm. And that really opened my eyes because I found a whole lot of disconnects in, in the beginning right, right. once I really thought about it. Yeah. And it's just, I was like, oh my goodness, there really was not a marriage there. Yeah. It was, I, it was not yeah. a sacramental loving relationship under God. Yeah. In some sense, the fact that you, you mm-hmm. got all the way up to the church and then encountered the necessity of receiving an annulment mm-hmm. and it and didn't have any understanding of even why you would have to do that, right. that itself sort of reveals like, okay, my understanding of marriage was obviously very different than how it's been understood throughout the history of the church. Oh, yeah. And in, even in my marriage prep in the Foursquare Church, yeah. I didn't have an understanding of what marriage was right, after that. Right. I was amazed at how much of a disconnect there was in my head mm-hmm. about, you know, legal marriage, but the marriage that God intended. Yeah. Yeah. The church takes these things really seriously because oh, it, yes. it's it's not something that we're doing. It's something that, that we guard and we but when we approach, but it's ultimately the sacraments is something that God does. He draws close in these circumstances. And so being really clear about what those are, when they really are there, when they're not, that's the church takes that real seriously. So finally, after a long last, after much perseverance, the, it comes through. Yes. Yeah. So okay. now on to my husband yeah. and his annulment. Right. Um, he wasn't in he wasn't in my position where he was really on fire to get to that finish line and get yeah. this done so he could move on and all of that. So he was taking his time. Mm-hmm. Um, I love him, but mm-hmm. he was taking his time. <laughs> and I'm just yeah. like, you need to get this done, please, and turn mm-hmm. it in. Because I could not become Catholic until his annulment was taken care of. Mm-hmm. So several months later, um, his comes and his annulment came through. Mm-hmm. And it was the week before Easter Vigil 2019. Mm. So I called my pastor and I said, okay, I'm ready. Both annulments came through and I'm going to be ready on Easter Vigil and I'm so excited. And he said, well, there's another step. And I'm like, God, really? (laughs) Why? Why? Keep looking at that crucifix. (laughs) Why are you doing this to me, man? (laughs) He said that I might have to get we might have to get our marriage convalidated in the mm-hmm. church. And <clears throat> and I had been to a friend's convalidation ceremony, so I had an idea of what it was. And for those who don't know what that, what that, what would that, what would that entail? It's basically um, having almost like a wedding ceremony, mm-hmm. but on a little bit of a smaller scale. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> and you can have it with a mass or not, mm-hmm. or at least in my diocese, that's how it works. But it's the, the church is recognizing <laughs> and blessing this Mm -hmm. marriage that was previously done outside the church. Correct. Yeah, okay. And he said, my my priest said, I don't know if we're going to have time to do that before Easter Vigil because it was within a week. Yeah. And I was so upset, and he goes, this is what I want you to do. He's like, I would like you to pray for the intercession of Mary, undoer of knots. Just pray that this is all going to work out and that she will guide you through it. He's like, I'm going to call the tribunal and see what our next step is. So I would just walk around work. I would take a break and walk around and just pray to Mary and ask for her intercession. I said, undo this knot because I feel like I've been in this knot for a while and please help me figure this out. You're like the the guests at the wedding of Cana going to Mary, saying, what do we do about this? Right. It's like, what do I do? I'm, I'm, I'm doing what I need to do, yeah. but it just, I keep hitting what I felt like were roadblocks. Mm. And my priest called me the next day and he said, you don't need a convalidation. He's like, neither you or your husband were baptized. Mm. And he's like, your marriage is considered a natural marriage right. in the church. Right. And he's like, I'll see you Easter Vigil. Ah, wonderful. Yeah. All right. So you did it. So tell us about Easter Vigil. 
I don't remember a lot. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's kind of like a wedding night almost, sure. you know? You have this big ceremony and party and then you wake up the next day and you're just like, what happened? <laughs> it's a blur. But I do remember I was the first one to get baptized. There was a long line of us. Right. And um, of course, my mom did not come and a lot of family members did not come. Right, we didn't even talk about that. Yeah, so that was hard for them. Yeah, they didn't want to be there. Okay. And that was really hard. Um, of course, my, my dad said he would be there. He came and my husband, my daughter, a bunch of my friends. And so I, I go and I get baptized and just completely drenched, <laughs> you know. And as soon as I stepped out of that baptismal water, I lost it, mm -hmm. started sobbing uncontrollably. I couldn't speak. I couldn't, like my friend, my sponsor, Rachel, had to lead me out over to the bathroom because I just lost it. Mm. It was overwhelming. Yeah. yeah. So that night you, rece you mm -hmm. received baptism. Mm -hmm. And did you receive the other sacraments all that night yes. as well? Yes. Wow. Yep, confirmation. All of that. Wow. All right. So what happened after that? Get, bring us uh, the, the fallout from becoming Catholic and also you know, bring us to the present. Well, uh, yeah. I had forgotten to mention that mm. my daughter got baptized in the Catholic faith before I did. Oh, okay. Um, we had her baptized right before I started RCIA. And um, I had invited, of course, everyone in the family and I got a lot of people telling me no. Hmm. And that upset me because this wasn't about me or my decision to convert or any, or any of that. It was about my daughter becoming baptized into the family of Christ, whom you all worship. Mm -hmm. But they said no. And I'm like, you are not gonna be there for my daughter on this most important day. Yeah. And I, I cried a lot yeah. because it hurt and it was hard. And it hurt when they didn't come to my baptism either. But by the, by the time I got baptized, mm -hmm. I was a little more not used to it, but I knew that they were going to say no. Yeah. But it was really hard when it came to my daughter's baptism. Right. Yeah, because again, it highlights the difference uh, in how we see the sacraments. I mean, if you were, imagine for a moment that you were speaking to your younger self, you know, that's on the other side of all these sacraments. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, how would you explain, you know, the difference in how Catholicism views what the sacraments are to your younger self as a little thought experiment? Well, I, I mean, I was familiar with the Bible, but mm -hmm. the passage about baptism mm -hmm. and how you must mm -hmm. have baptism, it is not a, you know, if you want to, this is something you can do. Right. And just the feeling of um, just the cleansing of your soul. Mm -hmm. And it's so, I don't know how to just, how can you describe something that is so deep and so real to you? Yeah. But I would tell my younger self, <laughs> listen. There is a relationship with God out there. It doesn't look like what you think it looks like. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't look like what you've been taught yeah. to think that it is. Yeah. But it is there and it is waiting for you and you will never be the same. Yeah. And I felt like I had to go through trial by fire mm -hmm. because it was years before I finally got baptized. Yeah. And it was a lot of family and friends telling me I was crazy and they didn't right. understand why I was doing it and it made no sense and ooh, Catholicism, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And I wasn't doing it with a family member. I didn't go through it with a friend. Mm -hmm. It was just me. So yeah. there were times that I was just like, why am I hanging myself out here yeah. in front of the fire brigade? I don't, <laughs> <laughs> why am I doing this to myself? Well, and bed business is a significant <laughs> one to focus on because uh, unlike some of the other sacraments, baptism we receive even as infants in the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. which highlights that baptism does something. God is doing something. It's not dependent on my choice, per se. It's not dependent on my feelings or my emotions, right? right? I may not be having a, a big emotional, charismatic experience, 
it's what God is doing. And so it's funny because from the outset, sometimes people look into Catholicism and say it's a bunch of rules and check boxes and yep. a bunch of works righteousness. Mm -hmm. When really on the inside, we're, we, we recognize, you know, these sacraments are something God's doing. You know, and, and, and it, it, my part in it is minimal. It's about right. God doing something to me right. you know, out of his great grace and, and love. Mm -hmm. so we have about uh, four minutes left. I mean, bring us up to the present. Again, what, what, what happened after you became Catholic and, and what are you doing nowadays? <laughs> right. So, um, you know, attending mass, bringing my daughter with me, of course, mm -hmm. and trying to teach her about the faith, getting her into her um, religious education courses mm -hmm. and helping her get ready for her first confession, which was just wonderful. Mm -hmm. And then she gets her confirmation and she's so excited about it. And I just love teaching her about the faith. You know, we pray together every night and she, um, you know, she is starting to do the thing that I used to do is don't wake me up. I don't want to go. I don't, don't make me go to church, but I'm really trying to in, instill in her things that I felt like were not instilled in me mm. as a child. Mm -hmm. But, <laughs> you know, for all my railing and ranting against the annulment process, uh, the deacon who um, helped me through it, called me and mm -hmm. asked me if I would join his, the nullity ministry at mm -hmm. the parish and get trained in canon law and help other people with their annulments. And I'm, wow. I was like, really? And he goes, I think you would be just right for it. Yeah. So I got trained in the that part of canon law. Mm -hmm. And for the past few years, I've been helping people with their annulments, which there are different kinds. They're not yeah. all formal like mine. Right. And it's it's been so great because I am helping them enter the church into full communion. Yeah. And I get to kind of relive that. Right. And you know their pain. You know mm -hmm. the, how it's bewildering and right. how you're sort of against the trial by fire. In the end, you're going to understand <laughs> the reason. Right. But at the outset, it's just a struggle. It is. Know? And I tell them, I'm just yeah. like, this is going to be worth it. It is. Trust me. Stick mm -hmm. with it. Because there are a lot of people who come meet with me mm -hmm. and I tell them, Here's what we need to do, and I never hear from them again. Right, which is sad. Yeah, well, that it highlights that you know there's there's different aspects to the faith. There's the intellectual. Uh, again, you, you started your journey asking those questions and digging into the reading and all that, and that's an important part of it. But a lot of it is just experiential. It's just wor working through it and coming to know Christ, coming to you know, this this reverence, this experience, experience of the sacraments, and you need other people for that. Right. You need the, the support of a community, you mm -hmm. know, and I, that's a wonderful mi ministry for you to be part of. Mm -hmm. uh, we're walking through other people going through that same process. Yeah. All right. Well, Courtney, thank you so much for sharing your story yeah. with us. I appreciate it. Thank I, you. And I pray that, uh, thank you for joining us for this episode. I pray that Courtney's story was an inspiration to you. You know, again, as, as we highlighted there toward the end, uh, we can read all about the church. You know, we can we can approach the church, we can read our way in, but ultimately... Uh, they're still going through the process. They're still receiving the sacraments. They're still working through the complicated emotions. Uh, and so it's great to hear that there is that ministry available to those who are uh, needing to go through annulments. Right. Um, it highlights something I wanted to, to bring up at the end here, that uh, the Coming Home Network, if you go to chnetwork.org, uh, we have a whole ministry of accompaniment uh, as people encounter the Catholic Church. And actually, if you go to the website and click on community, we have a whole online community of people converts as well as journeyers who are encountering the sacraments, who are learning about the Catholic faith, and who are, in many cases, having to uh, uh, discover the, the truth and beauty of marriage the hard way, mm -hmm. you know, through the, the annulment process, going through these long processes, a lot of patience, a lot of pain, a lot of yeah. revisiting things. Right. And so, um, you know, uh, you, you can check out that, that community uh, for, to, to connect with others who are going through that process and have accompaniment, fellowship on that journey. So... And we'll be praying for, for you, all those who are going through that process, for sure. All right. All right. So well, once again, uh, God bless you. Thank you for joining us for this episode of the Journey Home Program. We'll be back next week with another story. I want to remind you, as always, hey, that it's not just uh, coming on the show and, and listening to other people's stories and being encouraged by them. It's, it's very important. But you yourself are on a journey. That's what we always want to be reminded by these stories, that um, for Catholicism, everything is significant. Everything that's happened to you is significant. God is on a journey with you. He's present with you. He's in your pain. And that was an important part of that story that we heard tonight with, from Courtney, looking at that crucifix up on the wall in our churches, in our homes, remembering that, you know, that's the reality of our sin, of our brokenness, but that's also the reality of the depth of God's love. 
He's with you in your pain. He's with you in your difficulty. There's a next step that he's giving you the grace to take. So let's pray together that we see that next step. We take it in courage today. We'll be back again next week to hear another story. God bless you.